The riots were started by the Chicago Police Department. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 things the trial of the Chicago 7 got factually right and wrong. Cite Mr. Counselor with his second count of contempt. Sending Daphne O'Connor to break my heart was way out of line. Mr. Kunstler, the demonstrators attacked the police and the police responded. For this list, we're looking at plot points from this historical legal drama that were true to real life or fictionalized for the sake of storytelling. What did you think of the trial of the Chicago 7? Let us know in the comments. Number 10. Hoffman and Rubin wore judicial robes. Right. I have an egg. The film portrays Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin as a couple of jokers who treat the trial almost like performance art. And the record should reflect that defendant Hoffman and I are not related. Father, no. They see it as an opportunity to attract the media and more young people to the yippie movement, undermining the no-nonsense judge around every turn. Mr. Rubin, Mr. Hoffman. What are you wearing? It's an homage to you, Your Honor. One such example is when they appear in court wearing judicial robes, much to Judge Hoffman's annoyance. Take off the robes, please. <laughs> Silence! In real life, Hoffman and Rubin did show up in robes one day, although they were not wearing police uniforms underneath as depicted in the film. Upon taking the robes off, they used them to wipe their feet. This actually sounds like something that Sacha Baron Cohen might do if he were on trial, making his casting as Abby all the more brilliant. Number 9. FBI Agent Daphne O'Connor Wrong Played by Caitlin Fitzgerald, Daphne O'Connor is an undercover FBI agent who has a sort of romance with Jerry Rubin after buying him a drink at a bar. Nobody's ever sent me a drink before. How do you like it so far? It's a Tom Collins. I know it's kind of a country club drink, but they're delicious. Despite coming to empathize with Rubin's cause, O'Connor takes the stand and breaks his heart. The demonstrators attacked the police, and the police responded. Much like Rooney Mara's character in The Social Network, Daphne O'Connor is purely a creation of Aaron Sorkin. Granted, there are a few undercover agents who got close to the Chicago 7. Sending Daphne O'Connor to break my heart was way out of line. Erwin Bach and William Frappoli infiltrated the Vets for Peace and the Students for a Democratic Society. Rubin was personally duped by Robert Pearson, a Chicago police officer who went undercover as his bodyguard. Yet, there are no reports indicating that Rubin had a 93-hour fling with an FBI agent. Nothing is more dangerous than a crowd of people who are moving. It's like trying to redirect the Mississippi River. Isn't she great? Number 8. Judge Julius Hoffman's Incompetence Right. You're not going to let the jury hear his testimony. Not unless you can demonstrate to me, which you have not thus far done, that this yes, witness... Yes, sir. Are you any good? It's not uncommon for biopics to vilify authority figures, but Judge Julius Hoffman was every bit as antagonistic as Frank Langella's portrayal. Cite Mr. Counselor with his second count of contempt. Described as, quote, impetuous and rude in Joseph Golden's 1974 book The Benchwarmers, the 74-year-old Judge Hoffman prevented the jury from examining certain evidence that would have benefited the Chicago 7. Your parents received this note this morning in their mail. They called the police as they should have done. As in the film, the families of two young jurors received threatening letters allegedly from the Black Panthers, which the defense claimed were forgeries. Judge Hoffman showed them the letters, leading one to leave the jury. Do you still feel you can render a fair and impartial verdict? No, sir. You're dismissed from this jury. According to attorney Gerald Lefcourt, Judge Hoffman was, quote, pro-government on a mission, viewing the defense team as the, quote, enemy from day one. As such, the judge issued 175 counts of contempt of court throughout the trial. Number 7. Richard Schultz was sympathetic to the defendants. Wrong. Although he was a junior prosecutor, the film suggests that Richard Schultz sympathized with the Chicago 7. Nah, we're all on the same team. In a sense. I guess, but in a much truer sense, we're not. While Schultz does his job, he doesn't get much joy from it. Meanwhile, lead prosecutor Tom Ferran shows little empathy for the defendants. It's Schultz who pleads with Judge Hoffman to have mercy on Bobby Seale, leading to his mistrial. I'm issuing an order declaring a mistrial as to the defendant, Bobby G. Seale. In reality, this was the U.S. Attorney's Office's doing. Several people have argued that Schultz was far more hot-headed than seen in the movie. 
earning a reputation as, quote, the government's pit bull. What are you doing? Respect for the fallen? Defendant David Dellinger went as far as to call Schultz, quote, a snake and a, quote, Nazi. Some would also debate that Ferran was the more restrained of the two, although he did make plenty of controversial comments. Number 6. David Dellinger Punched a Marshal. Wrong. David Dellinger is depicted as a radical pacifist who wanted to keep the protests peaceful. You're a thug because you are dead. Please sit, Mr. Dellinger. Dellinger is finally pushed to his limits when Judge Hoffman throws out key testimony, calling him a, quote, thug. If we're guilty, why not give us a trial? Dave. Marshals, seat the defendant. If we're guilty, which you have clearly decided, Dave, I've got watch this. yourself. You have this culminates in Dellinger punching a marshal and apologizing before being dragged out. Watch you, sir. <laughs> Although it is a powerful moment, Dellinger never used physical violence in court. This isn't to say Dellinger never threw a punch in his life. Ahead of him. I'm sorry. He showed great remorse for knocking out another man in college, which may have inspired this scene. Throughout the trial, however, Dellinger stuck by his pacifist worldview. That said, he was escorted out at one point for interrupting a witness. It was at this point that Dellinger made his snake and Nazi comments about Schultz. Number 5. The jury didn't hear Ramsey Clark's testimony. Right. An investigation by our criminal division led to the conclusion that the riots were started by the Chicago Police Department. In the film, the case is seemingly blown wide open when Attorney General Ramsey Clark takes the stand. He recounts telling the president over the phone that the Chicago PD likely started the riots. The jury isn't present to hear this bombshell, however, and Judge Hoffman decrees that his testimony will not be shared. You're not going to let the jury hear his testimony. Not unless you can demonstrate to me, which you have not thus far done, that this yes, witness... Yes, Are you any good? Judge Hoffman did in fact bar Clark as a defense witness, ruling that he made, quote, no relevant or material contribution to the case. It's debatable if Clark's testimony truly would have been the smoking gun the film leads us to believe. Please, sir, I will be forced to find you in contempt. You understand? Nevertheless, defense attorney William Kunstler called Judge Hoffman's ruling, quote, absolutely unheard of in the history of the United States, adding that it, quote, sets a precedent that is horrendous to contemplate. Number 4. Jerry Rubin's Arrest. Wrong. In one of the movie's most intense moments, the police and protesters clash atop a hill, although this played out differently in reality. A fleet of officers wasn't waiting for the protesters when they arrived at the General John Logan Memorial. On the contrary, a significant number of cops intervened after the crowd started taking the hill. The scene shows Reuben rescuing a female protester carrying an American flag as three men force themselves on her. While there doesn't appear to be any account of this happening, Robert Pearson claims that a conflict did erupt over a communist flag. Don't move, Jerry. <laughs> Man, get those guys You're there. under arrest. Even so, Reuben wasn't arrested during the riot as the film depicts, but at a later time when he was on the street with a buddy. Number 3. Flow All Over the City Speech Right. We get to the root of the riots as Rennie Davis is beaten by the police at Grant Park. Out of nowhere. <laughs> motivating Tom Hayden to deliver his blood flowing all over the city speech. Although this wasn't the first time Hayden got fired up, it's widely believed that Davis's beating ignited his speech and the ensuing chaos. Yes, yeah, yeah. absolutely. If blood is going to flow... Let it flow all over the city! The gas is going to be used! Let it come down all over Chicago! We're going to the convention! Let's get on the street! Through his research, Aaron Sorkin found that Hayden meant to say, our blood. In an interview with GQ, Sorkin said, quote, I think that there's a part of Tom that feels like he inadvertently caused a tremendous amount of violence and all of the blood that was spilled that night. Not that Tom nor anyone else thinks that the riot was Tom's fault. The police could have easily not started smacking people in the head with baseball bats. Oh, you didn't try and stop anyone? No. Number 2. Bobby Seale's Mistreatment and Fred Hampton's Death Right. The Chicago 7 were truly the Chicago 8. I said it would be impossible for me to care any less what you are tired of. The eighth person in question was Black Panther Party co-founder Bobby Seale, who wasn't permitted to postpone his trial when his lawyer needed gallbladder surgery. It was premeditated murder. Yes, it was. Fred Hampton was assassinated last night. Unable to defend himself, Seale was left without counsel. Most notably, Seale really was restrained and gagged after an outburst. In the film, Seal's speech stems from Fred Hampton's shooting during a raid. 
Although this actually happened after Seal was bound in court, it's generally believed that Hampton's death was an assassination carried out by the FBI. Do I have your assurance? Seal was actually restrained for several days as opposed to a few minutes. Judge Hoffman would declare a mistrial, separating Seal from the other seven. Before we unveil our top pick, here are some honorable mentions. Abby Hoffman discussed the trial in public. Right. Check out his album Wake Up America if you want to hear more. They got Hayden! They got Hayden! We got to march down to the police station, overcome the cops and the Illinois National Guard, and free Tom Hayden! <laughs> We couldn't find our way out of the park. March to bail out Tom Hayden. Right. Protesters and police did confront each other at the station. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Reading the Names – Right and Wrong The film ends on a high note as Tom Hayden uses his closing statement to read off the names of the 4,752 U.S. troops who died in Vietnam since the trial started. Private Eric Allen Bosch, 21 years old. Mr. Kunstler! Lance Corporal Robert Earl Ellis, 19 years old. It's a triumphant moment, but did it really happen? Yes and no. While names of fallen soldiers were read aloud in court, it wasn't at the end of the trial, and it wasn't Hayden who led this act. Last Corporal Douglas W. Jackson, 19 years there old. Will be order. It actually happened on October 15, 1969, almost four months before sentencing, and David Dellinger read the names. James Clinton DeFranco, 19 years old. Corporal Kenneth Joe Austin, 18 years old. Judge Hoffman initially wasn't present as the names were being read. When he entered the courtroom, Judge Hoffman made Dellinger stop and an argument ensued. While altered, the ending we get is classic Aaron Sorkin. That's Richard Henry Durant, 20 years old. Last Corporal Harry Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from WatchMojo. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.